While in Havana, Cuba, we visited the Latin American School of Medicine, also known as ILAM. Students from low-income communities around the world come here to study to become primary healthcare physicians. Tuition, accommodation, and board are free, paid for by the Cuban government, and a small stipend is even provided for students to live on. A testament to Cuba's commitment to internationalism, ILAM is one of, if not the largest, medical schools in the world, with tens of thousands of students enrolling from over 100 countries. While there, we had the chance to catch up with second-year medical students from the U.S. and ask them about their experiences studying in Cuba. So why are you studying in Cuba instead of the U.S.? Um, so for me, I was always interested in going to medical school overseas. Um, I saw the healthcare system and how it worked in the U.S. And, you know, always growing up, we always knew that Cuban doctors were the best. They were always on the forefront of a lot of, you know, whether it was natural disasters or, you know. So for me, um, I decided that that was something that I wanted to pursue. So I did a lot of information uh, research. I found Pastors for Peace. You know, I saw their like mission statement and in terms of medical school in Cuba. And so a lot of what they put were things that, you know, really spoke to me and the kind of doctor I wanted to be, you know, not only just a doctor of science, but a doctor with a social consciousness. And I think that's what really motivated me to apply to and be here. There's a lot of aspects, but the focus in Cuba is a lot different than in the States. And specifically, they focus a lot more on community medicine and preventative medicine. And they really resolve a lot of the issues at a preventative medicine level that instead of just treating something, they try to prevent it. And in the States, we do a lot more of just treatment. Um, and so that's one reason, but also the Cuban way is very much, it teaches you about humanity along the way. And um, it keeps you very humble. Um, and it really does connect you with the people because the doctors are living among the same community that they're working in. And so you really learn a lot about how to be a humane doctor, not just how to, not just the knowledge of medicine. You guys are not paying anything to come to school here. So if you were in the U.S., obviously you would come out, you know, unless you have rich parents, you're going to come out of school with like a crazy amount of debt. So what opportunities does that open up for you when you go back to the U.S. or wherever you end up carrying out your medical career? Being in the U.S. and just knowing kind of like the filtration that has to go on to even become a doctor, I feel like that does prevent a lot of people, including myself, from even wanting to apply, just knowing the amount of debt that would come after that. So one of the benefits about Cuba is they really focus on the love of medicine and whoever wants to be a doctor has the opportunity to be that. So I think for me, it really opened the gateway for me to become a doctor. And I think that's something that I really appreciate. So I'm just curious, will the fact that you're not going to come out of school with like an insane amount of debt give you more opportunities to maybe pick specialties you otherwise wouldn't because maybe it doesn't make as much money as another one? Does that give you more opportunities, the fact that you get to come to school for free? Yeah, I think so. I think it also um, influences where I would be um, working as well. So uh, the, the whole point or the um, proposition of the school is for us to go back to help our communities, which are low-income communities. And so that definitely is an advantage of us not having debt. It really opens up the opportunities for us to do what we feel in our hearts is what we should do, not just to make money. Um, because at the end of the day, we're here and we're learning how to serve people. And that's what I would say all of us want to do, is we want to take care of people and serve the people around us. And a lot of times in the States, people can't do what they actually want to do because they're held up by this debt. And so, yeah, it gives us the freedom to choose what we want to do in terms of specialty, but even more in terms of our work. And once we get into actually being a doctor or a medico, as we say here, because we can actually go to the communities that we're in and we don't have to go to a high paying job just because we need to pay off the debt. And one thing that's really cool is so far, like I think you're four medical school students that we've talked to among, uh, what, nine Americans in this second year program, and you're all women. I don't know if everyone's a woman, but that's like a constant thing we've seen here visiting other clinics is that this, it seems to be a very female dominated uh, profession, uh, and also a lot of women of color. And it's kind of, it's very different from at least my experience in the US where when you go to the doctor, it's usually a white guy, right? So I'm just curious if that's been something you've noticed here, um, and, and if that's been, you know, how, do you, how you feel about kind of maybe seeing yourself reflected a little bit more in the profession here than you might in the U.S. 
Yeah, I definitely feel like it is a source of encouragement. Um, definitely a lot of our professors are women, are black women. Um, so it is really refreshing to see. That is one of, another reason that I, that's actually something that I did not expect um, coming here, but it was really like a breath of fresh air to be like, wow, there's someone who looks like me who's teaching me, um, someone that I can really look up to, because in the States you don't have that. Um, you have one in, I don't even know how many, um, but, uh, but here it really is, it is frequent. Um, and they are women that are, that are strong, that are intelligent, um, that's someone that you would really look up to. And so it is really great to have day-to-day uh, -to -day have those women in my life. Um, also, um, in the States, there's a lot of like, you know, racial barriers and gender barriers, which doesn't seem to be the case in Cuba, um, at least not from what I've seen. So also this is like an international school, so there is a lot of black, or uh, people of color here um, and also women here studying. I think it is empowering, you know, actually seeing role models and people that look like you. You know, again, even whether it's subconsciously, you know that you can do it or you know that people have done it before and they are a role model. So I think for me, it is refreshing being around people that look like you, that are studying, that are going through a similar path as you. And I feel like it just really gives motivation to actually continue and to pursue medicine. That's actually one of the goals of the program is that it's not just minorities, but it's also women of color and it's people of color and it's people of low income. It's people that normally you wouldn't see or wouldn't get the opportunity, specifically wouldn't get the opportunity, but because they wouldn't get the opportunity, you don't see them as much. And so that's something that Cuba does very well. And especially in the US side, they really choose candidates based off of that and your experience. Can you talk a little bit about comparing what we have in the States to what you see here in terms of the way medicine is practiced and delivered and what's important? <laughs> yes. So uh, we actually just came from, you know, an exam related to this. In Cuba, we do, um, we, uh, well, they do focus on preventative medicine. Mm -hmm. And so um, from the beginning, from pre-med, first year you are taught um, prevention, um, prevention of um, diseases and how to promote your health mm -hmm. and so that is one thing that is also different um, in the states um, almost the whole population knows something you know know something about their health there are people that would um, people would come into the consultorias from uh, my little shadow in and they already do know they already do know um, what is wrong with them why they're taking this medication um, the doses of their medication, the side effects because the doctors have educated them rather than just prescribed it to them and um, basically you know Cuban doctors have time for you and then they have time to explain everything how to prevent um, you know diseases from occurring as well. For me what I learned is that they really focus on the biopsychosocial model Right? So health is not just, or a sickness isn't just what's happening to your body, it's what other factors, social, whether environmental factors that contribute to one's health. So going based off of what you know, my friend just said, um, in pre-med and also in first year, we're very much integrated into the community. So we will go to policlinicos that are in the towns, and these doctors are very much involved with the people. Like they'll know every family within like their unit or their space. And so it's very much involved. So I feel like you also build, they also build that trust in terms of like doctor and patients. And they care about the overall well-being. Whereas I feel like in the States, you really don't know where doctors are coming from or if they prescribe something, is that the best? Or is it just best for the pharmaceutical companies? You know. So I feel like if you don't have that trust, that does create a barrier. And I feel like Cuba does a very good job in building that trust and that sort of relationship. You know, the issue of vaccines here, I know 90% of the population is vaccinated at least, which is incredible because there's not even a mandate for that. Whereas, as we all know, in the US, it's like there's a huge portion of the population that refuses to get vaccinated. And in some cases, like a lot of that has to do with a lack of public trust in the medical system, in the con like the government, which doesn't typically take care of people. So, you know, what's how do you compare what you've seen here in terms of the way that the state treats and takes care of people versus what you see in the U.S. So using the vaccine as an example, um, the Cuban population was involved, I would say they were involved mm -hmm. in the development of all of the vaccines that Cuban, uh, the Cuban, um, you know, the Cuban people have now because 
in every step of their um, you know, research and getting a vaccine journey, uh, we were given um, news journals on like what was going on, what they found and all of that. So it gives you, it makes you, you know, trust it more and you wouldn't have to, you know, be forced to take it because you know that it's, it's going to work. Yeah, basically. Yeah, they're very transparent. Yes. I would say the first big difference is that the health is in the hands of the people. A lot of the people here are very educated about their health and they really do know what's going on, but also they know a lot more about what health looks like and how to be a healthy person. Because here it's not just going to the doctor, but it's promotion of health. A lot of people know that, um, I know doctors. And so a lot of times when you travel around and you tell people that you're a medical student, um, they're like, oh yeah, my nephew, my daughter, my so-and-so. And so it's very common for people to know doctors. And so that means if these doctors are in their families that they trust them and they that they trust them and they have this uh, this knowledge as well, not only the academic knowledge, but the social knowledge. These doctors, or just the Cuban population, value the humanity and human life. And I feel like that's something that's very been put into question in the States. Um, some lives are more valuable than others, right? So then you really have to question, like, is my life valuable in the States? Whereas I feel like in Cuba, every life is valuable. And they will do their best to make sure, you know, that they will treat you the best way that you can. Are you vaccinated and with what vaccine? I'm just curious. <laughs> I am vaccinated with um, Abdallah and so I just got the um, booster shot of that. So I have five vaccines or four. So I'm vaccinated with Sobrana Plus because I actually had COVID here in Cuba. Um, and so I got COVID and they have a special vaccine that's only for people that had COVID, which is the only vaccine that at its time, I don't know about now, but at its time was the only one specifically for people with COVID. And so I was able to get that plus the booster um, here in Cuba. And, you know, obviously you're coming from the U.S., which we all grew up there. And you're kind of inundated with Cuba's an evil country, Cuba's a dictatorship, Cuba's awful. So, you know, you coming here, was that ever an obstacle, the way that you're sort of educated to hate Cuba in the U.S.? And then also, is it bizarre, like, when you're you know, maybe talking to friends or family, are they kind of like, why did you go to Cuba? Like, how do you deal with those conversations? I would say for me, it's definitely been, that's been a reality. And a lot of my family and friends still don't understand um, why I came to Cuba. And when I deal with that, I really just try to portray like the why and the why I'm here, but also the what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that if people see, not just here, then that's when they're gonna see the change because you can tell somebody all day, but when they see it being put into place, um, that's when the change becomes. And there's been people around me, like in my family specifically, who they were very against Cuba when I came, but I've just seen slowly, like over time, that has started to get a little softer. And so it's not an overnight change, but it's a constant um, reality. More so recently, a lot of Americans have really notice uh, the lies that the government and that the media is portraying um, in different facets of the world and of life. And so I think they're becoming more encouraged to do their own research, to go out and travel on their own. Um, and so I think that me being here is a testament to that. And so it's really encouraged a lot of people to really go out and uh, to visit me here or to read up on Cuba and like what it's really about. I just am curious, I mean, you're in Cuba, which is under this crazy crippling blockade that's become even more intense in the last couple of years. And what has that experience been like being in a country that's under blockade by, by your own government? We do have the advantage of knowing what the reality is and knowing the impact of the blockade. And so we see like in the States when you're, you're there, you know, you hear the news about the blockade. And even if you do your research and you hear what's going on in Cuba and do that from a taken back out of the States point of view, you're still, you're still out of it, right? But whenever we're here, we're living that reality and we're feeling the effects every day. And the struggles are real. The blockade has a very real impact on Cuba. And it's simple things like getting things in stores. It's hard to get things, not because it's somewhere else, but because there's a lack of it. And so it's like just the everyday reality is complicated by the blockade. And there's not a lot more I can say about that. There's a lot more I can say, but yeah. there's not a lot more to summarize that other than we feel the effects and we see them and we live them every day. And 
it's real and it's just you know it makes life difficult when it doesn't necessarily need to be and i would love to see cuba in a state of not having the blockade see it thriving under tourism and having people and access to things i it would be a beautiful beautiful thing to see but unfortunately that's not our reality right now and that's hard